Hello, and welcome to theCUBE here at the New York Stock Exchange. This is theCUBE's East Coast access point. This is our new studio. We have new sets here coming online in the next year, so you'll see a lot more content. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Dave Vellante and I will be doing tons of content here. And again, New York is popping with the tech scene here. It feels like Silicon Valley. It's all condensed, it's all here. And we're going to bring all that signal to you and link Silicon Valley and Wall Street together. Walt with Walt to Wall Coach. This is Media Day here. We're bringing investors and entrepreneurs together with companies that are really changing the game with technology and generating. John Lear is here, co-founder of Workbench VC. Uh, got a great network. John, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Thanks so for having me. what do you me. think about the new uh, location here? I Pretty am popping. loving the digs. <laughs> this is wonderful. You know, I grew up on, on the East Coast in New Jersey and uh, moved to California 25 years ago in Palo Alto. And, you know, New York's always had tech because you have the big banks here. They always invested in tech. They bought gear. They had data centers. And, but Silicon Valley kind of had, had that mark for the, you know, VC investments. A little bit more riskier. They throw money at early and then figure yeah. out the back end. New York was, and Boston was kind of like, okay, get everything teed up. It is so changed now. New York really feels like Silicon Valley almost 30 years ago where there's risk capital, you got great um, service providers around the entrepreneurs and the scene here, young, vibrant, concentrated. It feels like New York's like a big Palo Alto times 100. It's like, it's like because everyone's here. You, I mean, I was on the streets during Climate Week in the UN here, and I was in the Bowery area near, near uh, and walking down the street and literally heard people talking about Kubernetes. <laughs> okay, like, <laughs> That's how you know we made it. And I'm like, <laughs> damn, New York has made it. And this is, the tech is mainstream. You're seeing the consumer side of it. Yep. Um, you know, everyone's now seeing the wave is coming. We're in one of the big secular trends we haven't seen in my career, where front end and back end innovation is going on. And you're investing, you're making bets. You made a bet on Workbench um, a decade ago around your approach and doing really well. So congratulations. Thank you so First, much. First, tell me about the New York scene. Then I want to get into some of the things you're doing with Workbench. For sure. So you just kind of hit the nail on the head when you're doing that preamble where New York has actually always had the customer base. And it's not just that Silicon Valley had the startups, but we actually had the early adopter buyers. And that's something that is often overlooked because we'll get into how we have the risk capital over the last yeah. decade. But you know, I used to work in IT at Morgan Stanley, and a lot of people from the outside don't appreciate, but Wall Street is the earliest and largest adopter of enterprise software, right? At this point, it was over a decade ago, but we had a $4 billion IT budget. I was on a pretty unique team called the Office of the CIO. We were tasked with being a go-between, between on the one hand, corporate IT that had pain points up and down the tech stack. Back then, it was early days of big data, Hadoop, things you don't think about anymore, right? First inning a cloud, new security paradigms, things that we take for granted yeah, now, but yeah. we're all new and fresh. And on the other hand, you had primarily the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. Yeah. And our job was to figure out which of these startups, hundreds of which are you know, pinging us a day, actually solve pain points yeah. internally. And equally importantly, for the ones that can align to a use case, which actually can we help sell into, navigate, and close deals with the bank. So it wasn't just us at Morgan, but across financial services, pharma, media, those are the three big industries that are all here and all early adopters. So, you know, as that has continued to grow along yeah. with the VC ecosystem, it really puts New York in an incredible place. You know, it's just when you run up the whole history there, but another thing I would note on that that I like is that with the cloud adoption over the past decade, you, you know, you said you were there from inning one, but now we're in kind of the, the double header, second game of the double header of cloud, it's next gen. But the ecosystem of SaaS vendors really opened up this idea of startups getting access to the big companies. Now we're in an era of connected ecosystem where it's not just APIs with just some connections, connections, because Gen AI is data driven, you're seeing the big Morgan Stanley's and JP Morgan's of the world, and Morgan Stanley's of the world say, hey, I got to have not only API connective tissue, but I need intelligence yep. with these networks. So you're seeing kind of, I won't say small ball developing, but you're starting to see, hey, if you're going to be a partner, one, they're still open to startups, number one. Number two, these startups are also leading the Gen AI way, which makes them valuable. They got to have platform hooks into it. So that's not just loading software and self-serving yep. SaaS vendors. So not only having the big companies here, but now the startups actually getting in and connecting with the platform, with this platform engineering is a very nuanced point, but I want to bring it up because again, there's an appetite for the Goldman's and the JPCs to have this connection and, this, and still an opportunity for startups. What's your reaction? So I think when you talk about platform, it means so many different things these days. When we talk about cloud and you're making that joke about Kubernetes, What's really interesting to me in infrastructure is that you went cloud, you had VMs, you had Kubernetes as the last big infra wave, 
Four Twelve Hundreds are still actually adopting that, right? So I know there's been a lot of investment two clicks out, but I still think, and we still think as a firm at Workbench, we've got to get that right yeah. and orchestrate it right internally. Now when you start talking about things like Gen AI and even just other software, the question becomes, how do you integrate to their stack internally? Because again, we're here in New York. <laughs> the thing that I'm going to say over and over is customer empathy. They have budgets, yeah. you have to help them unlock it. Yeah. So how do you understand their environments, work within their frameworks, and not every potential prospect is going to align with you, yeah. right? They may be off cycle, they may be slow in bringing on a snowflake, they may be later on at Databricks, wherever yeah. they are in that journey. How do you then meet them where they are, or say, hey, I'll come back to you in a year. Yeah. But the beauty of New York is there's so many different customer potential folks here. Yeah. That startups, if they navigate it right, can then say, oh, right place, right time. Now, what is my deployment going to look like? Yeah. And you can work with them on you know, that. Just saying, you mentioned the problems that you saw. And similarly, when Facebook and some of these hyperscalers that were not the big clouds, they had to build their own stacks from scratch. You had to solve your own problems. <clears throat> I was talking with Jim Walker last night, who I've known from, from for over yep. a decade. And he was like, John, these young guys, they don't even know what they don't know, but they're so brilliant. The talent is so strong. He's like, I met a startup that could do V motion on bare metal. They don't know how valuable it is. So what's happening is you're starting to see these hard problems that were statically built and or still scaling. Either they were manually end-to-end -end constructed workflows. Now the young guns are coming and going, that's no problem because they're just so technically strong. They yep. don't have the dogma or don't know what they don't know. They're like, oh, that's an easy problem. They just look at it from a fresh perspective. And I think that to me is another sign here. Talent strong and the problem statements are, they're comfortable with taking on tough problems, yeah. but they don't have the blinders of, wait a minute, there's all these constraints. They just go, oh, that's easy. I do think that's been probably, if you had to nail the biggest change back to the first question of the last decade, it's been that. So, you know, we talked about wave one of New York, there was always Wall Street buyers here, but, you know, if we think about it from the tech side, there was the ad tech wave, right? Things like double click and whatnot with big outcomes. But think about some of the tech that enabled that. Wave two, I would call media e com so companies like Gilt, like Etsy, but if you think about it, Gilt actually produced incredible data science talent here. Yeah. Etsy and Tumblr's produce incredible infra. I mean, yeah. we used to do tech talks, you know, again, at Morgan Stanley Days 2011, we brought in the head of infra from Tumblr to talk to IT execs. Yeah. You know, a decade yeah. before that, that would have been absurd, but here we wanted to learn yeah. from how they were handling web scale, which was just, you know, it had surpassed yeah. even Wall Street yeah. needs. So you've got incredible talent to your point yeah. with a fresh lens that isn't kind of yeah. like held back by the past. What's wonderful about New York is when you marry that with the customer yeah. empathy to understand, all right, I've got an incredible new way to do things. Yeah. There's a pain point here. Where can they intersect to actually build a massive startup? Because yeah. tech alone isn't going to solve a problem and, you know, living in the past and not being open-minded yeah. isn't either, but it's that intersection that's wonderful. Interesting, I want to get to Workbench in a minute, but I want to just take one, one more thread off this because I think this is like another chapter here we can explore. IT used to serve the business. And you said, you know, we all knew that world really well. Okay, yeah, now it is the business. Yep. So the whole, what is IT is changing. So one of the things we've been putting out there in theCUBE is like, well, if IT was serving the business and they were an asset, and we all know IT departments from the old days. Oh, I got a new PC, load the virtual desktop, yeah. come up, plug connect the internet, in. plug stuff in, good <laughs> help ticket. You know, I, I'm the user, I just want to be productive. Productivity now is becoming such an important part of the R, initial ROI and beachhead of Generative AI. That's the new IT, so you have all these domain experts in these workflows and these apps, whether it's the data scientist or yeah. someone who knows the application, they become the new asset of contributing to the value of the end-to-end -end new Gen AI, either retrofitted app or net new application. So yeah. you're starting to see the asset value of the person automate in IT and then shift to where the productivity gains are. What's your What's your, what's your reaction to that and what's your, what, anything yeah, to add to that? Yeah, so I think that people are more than ever in this Gen AI story because again, there's so many different constituents compared to past tech trends. So number one, you've got IT being more front facing, more hands on. You've got build versus buy being taken more seriously than in the past. A lot of people physically just couldn't even yeah. do it. And you know, think back, what was it, 15 years ago, does IT matter, those books and things <laughs> like that. Clearly now it's just an enabling front line. Uh, but then you've got the cloud providers, Amazon, Google's of the world, Microsoft obviously doing stuff in Gen AI. You've got OpenAI, you've got Anthropic. So there's so many different players from the traditional cloud giants to this next gen of AI. But then you've also got, again, back to our earlier point, existing infra investments made by organizations. 
we were we were laughing before about banks that have access to data that's not available for OpenAI to scrub. The big question then becomes, what can folks at these big organizations do with their own data? Yeah. So that is an edge that they have versus someone coming out of the blue yeah. with a model that's trained on just public internet data. And you know the confluence of all of this is why, frankly, if I'm going to rate it as a whole, I think we're still in analysis paralysis mode. There was a lot of zeitgeist in 23 around, I'm going to bring on LLM tooling and model visibility and I'm going to build stuff and I'm going to get prompt engineering software. And it's like, everyone I think paused because they were like, what are we even doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you would get those centers of excellence that have yeah. four different stakeholders from yeah. teams internally and yeah. it kind of went nowhere. But then what I think, and again, that's it's such a big shift, you expect yeah. that and that's yeah, a yeah. healthy exercise actually. 2024, what we see now is, where can we actually augment in our employees? One of the biggest ways that's honestly the easiest deployed has just been co-pilot. Yeah. Every big company I talk to is rolling out various pilots with you know hundreds to thousands yeah. of developers, and just being able, if we think about where its strength is, right, understanding yeah. the code base and then doing some of that code gen stuff, it's an easy way to prove efficacy and ROI. Yeah. Another big one is search internally, right? Yeah. Can we retrieve documents internally if we're given access in a way that like yeah. the old Google search appliance can't do yeah. and other tools <laughs> like that? So really where we're at Low is- Low-hanging fruit use cases to show proof points that's where Either I think from a it's budget happening. standpoint. So you start to see, it's not like a bubble bursting like the dot-com bubble where it ended up happening anyway. It's more of, hey, I can actually get productivity gains and quantify it. Yeah. Ticket, Jira tickets, gone. Search, retrieval document, more productivity. Okay, that's an obvious benefit. And that feeds the path with some of these important but smaller in the grand scheme wins to then say, all right, what can we build internally or what do we bring a third party in and how do we have a framework for evaluating where we take those risks? Because again, at the end of the yeah. day, yeah. the big other enterprise thing you need is trust. Yeah. And whether it's an open AI that's going to get a multi-million dollar contract with a big company, Anthropic, or yeah. some small upstart that's 10 people, what are they doing? What data are they touching? They have to get comfortable yeah. with those frameworks. That's awesome. Great, great commentary. You'll be a regular here on the New York <laughs> Cube uh, subnet, super pop we call them, super node. Uh, I want to talk about um, the work you've done with Workbench, um, you know, and, and talk about how that came to where it is today. But but also talk about why it was successful. And I think for the folks watching, Workbench became I, I think one of the first waves of practical investors who have been there, done that, who brought people who know what it looks like, knows how sausage is made, as they say, uh, and then just built a great firm. And also you have a great community. You were doing meetups before they were fashionable on the bigger scale, you're still doing those. Talk about Workbench, what you're investing in, and how you got here, and then what are some of the key milestones? So first of all, thanks so much for the kind words. And I think the best description that we always lean into is the practical. You said it's practical. So again, I was at Morgan Stanley IT engaging with startups all day. The big thing that really caught my attention was how many VC funds in Silicon Valley would start with the tech. They would hang out at the Facebook campus, the Google cafeteria, yeah. fund a couple folks. Yeah. And then the first thing they would do for the enterprise is lob it to us. Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, BFA, yeah. the early adopters. But far too often it was yeah. a square peg in a round hole. But if you think about it in the enterprise, it's more a game of like 3D chess than a game of buying a lottery ticket to find the next yeah. Facebook like it is in consumer tech. In the enterprise, there's pain points, priorities, and yeah. budget dollars. So as my co-founder Jess and I in 2013 looked around this ecosystem, we're like, why has no one flipped this model yeah. on its head? And you know, candidly, that's exactly what we did. We start with the corporate buyers, all the various industries, again, Finster, Pharma, Media, et cetera, here in our backyard to figure out what is top of mind you know, in the early days, again, big yeah. data, now more recently, Gen AI, security, dev tools. So it's, what's really cool about that approach is we get to hear where is the puck going 12, 18 yeah. months out. So it's not a problem today, yeah. but where are you looking yeah. in the future? And when you talk to different industries, you de-risk the market sizing risk issue. When you understand there's budget there, you know, you're never going to be perfect, especially yeah. at seed. There's other exogenous <laughs> factors exactly. around execution, but to the extent possible, yeah. we're trying to become practical. Yeah. And then the next step is, finding those startups. And this is where the community comes in. To reference the meetups, dating back to January 2012, while I was still at Morgan Stanley, seeing the rise of this tech ecosystem in New York, but my, mainly consumer based, and seeing my day job, I was like, we got to have a meetup for us enterprise folks. We deserve yeah, some love exactly, too, right? Exactly, enterprise. And what we always Back like then, to say, it was not a lot of love for the enterprise back then. It was kind of like, enterprise, all consumer. That's now what enterprise it was. is everything. 
So I, I'll never forget the earliest events. Yeah. We brought together what we like to call the yeah. suits and hoodies, corporate exec startups. That draws the investors. You get students looking for jobs. You get later people, yeah. you know, joining that are just getting the flywheel going and people get funded, hired. And that meetup, you know, we just hosted yeah. one last week at Ramp with two great yeah. product leaders from Ramp and Figma. We're running that basically 13 years later because at the end of the day, number one, there needs to be authenticity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's the corporate community we engage with, whether it's founders, yeah. whether it's other investor constituents, by leading with that give first mentality yeah. to bring the ecosystem together, yeah. that is a strength of New York, right? Yeah. We were laughing before about in California, you have to drive around everywhere, whether you're in the SF, Palo Alto, LA yeah. ecosystem, it's not connected here, everyone's a subway right yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. So bringing that group together yeah. at a regular cadence has really built that community Well, I think us. you guys pioneered, which is now also viewed as founders investing in all the A round pre-seeds and seeds are mostly done by other entrepreneurs going with founders or trusted folks who have been there like you guys. And you guys pioneered that. We're not your classic VC, invest out of Stanford or Cal. Oh, this is a PhD student. That was the old model. And there's the classic Steve Jobs clip that's always flying around Instagram, where it's that one, I think it was when we just came back around 2000, uh, no, no, 98 time frame where he had all the scar tissue and he was on the stage at Macworld and he said, you got to work backwards from the customer. It was a scene where yes, he, he was really humble. It was, it, was, it was a vulnerable time for Steve Jobs. He basically said, hey, he was basically saying I had scar tissue to prove it, but what he was saying was, I did it wrong. I would focus on the tech, then you got to work backwards from the customer and then get to the tech. So that's kind of your approach. I just want to highlight that because I think everyone sees that and they go, that's the key. But the other one is, and I see startups make this mistake, uh, you pointed out, is that Getting the beachhead and is where it actually, and there's a lot of documentation out there for in all the startup literature where it's like, you got to zig and zag a lot, but you oh got to be at least directionally product market fit there. So getting a beachhead to say, okay, we solve a problem, but it's not boiling the ocean over. I'm in Morgan Stanley. I got a good relationship going. I solved the problem, getting paid, but there's headroom, but I'm, it's not a straight line. That's exactly. where the opportunity goes. Which so for us, what we've really built Workbench as an institutional seed fund dedicated to investing, right? And you know, today, whether it's pre-seed seed, it could be, I'm about to leave my company to I'm raising a five, $6 million seed round. We'd love to play there. And basically what we do is we call it that zero to one go to market journey. But it's not just about even, you know, what, whether the one is your first million dollars of ARR, it, we like to break it into chunks. So that zero to 0.25, if I call it, is how do I even tell the story? What is the messaging around yeah. what we do? Now our team has expertise. We have advisors yeah. that we bring to bear, right? That 0.25 to 0.5 could be, how do I even then go talk to people yeah. and who do I talk to, right? That ICP or ideal customer profile. Are you going top down day one? Are you going yeah. more bottoms up? Are you going middle out? There's not one size fits all. And this is yeah. honestly, you know, 11 years in, what keeps us excited every yeah. day because each case is different and the playbooks are different. But when we have that general framework to figure yeah. out here's who you should be talking to and this is what success looks like, you then can start getting, whether it's design partners or customers going, and that's yeah. where the fly will start spinning. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, how do I actually scale this go-to-market? Who's the right sales yeah. leader to bring in? And then obviously filling them when possible with customer intros, back channel, and then yeah. packaging all that up. And you need someone that's patient and experienced, yeah. right? I yeah. found that too many Silicon Valley uh, f funds will invest and then tomorrow they want just the quick returns. And yeah. to do enterprise right, I always like to say, thoughtful and steady wins the race, because you've yeah. got to be deliberate in how you build the product, listen to the input yeah. from the potential customer prospects, and then keep learning each way What's as you great go. is the cloud has brought so much more scale and speed to that enterprise. It's, it's hard, there's hard problems. I mean, you got to do the hard work. Enterprise isn't as easy as- There's no shortcuts. You can't buy product market fit with a $50 million funding round. Yeah, if you get your identity architecture wrong, you can be screwed. So it's like a lot of nuance, a lot of like end-to-end in, -end workflow issues. All right, so next final question for you is, okay, yeah. what are you investing in now? And now that you guys are more mature, you're you know 10 plus years in, um, what are you investing in? What are you looking for for entrepreneurs? And yeah. how are you guys operating now? And how are you guys handling being a little bit older? Yep, for sure. So. If I start about how we invest, uh, we're quite active. Folks should go to work-bench.com, publishing the research around themes that we're looking at. Uh, what we love from a founder perspective, if they've lived there, been there, done that. So we have a company, Fire Hydrant, in the incident management space. Robert, the CEO, was an SRE. Viso Trust and Third Party Risk, the founder, Paul, was a CISO. You're going to have Jake from on. He's lived this pain point around permissions and where they break down when you're trying to configure them into your app. So they have so much empathy for the problem and the expertise to solve it. So that's the next step. Now, 
what we look for. And round size of seed and, or A's or what uh, So it's all seed, but today the, the naming, thin. depending on the day, you know, pre-seed, seed. seed, seed but 10. basically our check size is going to be anywhere from two and a half to four. Got is it. how we invest. So we're not going to do A's because A's these days are 10 like to 20 six, yeah, versus, yeah, you know, when we first met a decade ago, an A was maybe $4 million. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I try to not even say, we say seed generally. Seed's but a new way. <laughs> it, Exactly. So, but we'll, nothing is too early for us. Yeah, we'll yeah, have people it. that we meet at meetups that are thinking about leaving their job, whether they're at an Okta or a Zendesk working on a net new idea. And we love to yeah. engage there and even help them launch the, the yeah. product. And then uh, in terms of trends, right, uh, to rapid fire a few of them, What's really been interesting for us in the infra world is we've, the team last week, because I say it so much, but it's, for us, we've actually been looking a lot at orchestration automation. Yeah. I was saying before, there's not, Kubernetes is still being figured out and adopted. You know, there's been a lot of hype around things like WebAssembly and a lot of money went into categories like that, but we haven't just seen the commercial pull yet yeah. from a use case perspective. So we just did a company a few months back uh, that started in the CI CD world, but that went into build automation. We have a company that's in the FinOps category where and they're still stealthy, but basically there's a lot of visibility tooling. No one has actually focused on the remediation part. So they have a low code builder that actually lets you plug in visibility insights, plug into your yeah. Active Directory internally, plug into your chat ops, and then the end resources that you have to turn off or whatnot. Yeah. So it's again, it's how do you make people's jobs yeah. better and quicker? And the last example I'll give is a company, AutoKid A, which is an abstraction on temporal. So the last one was low code builder. This is actually code first automation. If you're familiar with temporal, yeah. you know, you spoke Jim, like the, uh, basically that's a superpower for hardcore devs. How do we bring some of yeah. that durable execution prowess to, you know, maybe a, a, a less experienced developer yeah. with the code first automation. So that's been the infra world in the AI space because we're a seed fund and we can't just write $50, yeah. $50 million checks like they're candy, <laughs> nor would yeah. we. But we've been actually spending a lot of time in vertical AI opportunities. So to talk about one example, uh, because the infra and tooling has been so all over the place and, and difficult to figure out like what wins while the ground is moving underneath you, while yeah. Databricks is making their moves, OpenAI and everyone else. Uh, an example is we invested in three former data robot executives that had been on the front lines deploying these auto ML models. And they're doing something really interesting in the credit space where take away the word AI for a minute, historically it was very tough to compete as an upstart because you didn't have access to data. This is where the beauty of Gen AI comes in. Yeah. They can actually pull tons of public data resources and make them usable in a way that was just unprecedented yeah. compared to the past. Final, final question. Enterprise AI, I uh, saw a stat from IBM that they got from McKinsey, only about 1% utilization right now. What's your view on this? What's the path look like uh, from your perspective? Obviously, you're in the vertical, so you're seeing the domain expertise there. What's the What's the market look like from an enterprise AI perspective from your It's kind of like looking at cloud a decade ago. You know things are happening. You know that's going to be the day-to-day -day where it's going to just be embedded in everything we do between agents, between co-pilots. But again, to my point, I think last year we reached peak hype in 23. 24 is way more practical. So it is first inning, yeah. but there's so much excitement ahead. Yeah. And I'm excited personally about what have we, we even realized is possible yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, we're looking to invest. Well, John, great to have you on theCUBE here. We're kind of phasing in it's our, our, our first quarter here in New York. We'll be up and running next year. Pumped to throttle. have you here. Yeah, Welcome no, to town. <laughs> yeah, you see a lot of us. Me, I'll be here. I might be probably living here. I love the location. Again, the action in New York's hot. Congratulations for all the work you've done. Thank uh, you, and, and the likewise. Team here. Yeah, congratulations. So good to see you. Yeah, New York is really turning into quite the tech powerhouse. It's been phasing in over the past decade. Google, Facebook, they're all here. All the big hyperscales are here as well. Concentrated talent, concentrated ideas, concentrated entrepreneurial activity, but also the customers. You know, one block is five customers. So, you know, dream scenario for entrepreneurs, again, we're starting to see this bridge, Silicon Valley and Wall Street and New York City. And of course, theCUBE's going to open it up and keep on programming. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.